Hi, everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella, my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. How are you doing tonight, Coco? Um, well, I'm still drinking the liquor that I was during the first part of our episode, but it's also my lucky day because once again, we are going to finish our series talking to the one and only Autumn Rain's heart, everybody. Yay. Hi, how are you? Hold for applause. There is none because it's Autumn. No, it's because <laughs> it's the Embers and there was no one there. <laughs> <laughs> so for our listeners who are tuning into this episode, remember to listen to our first part of this series. We are talking about the Embers Avenue. Um, it is now closed. Our special guest this week, as I said before, is Autumn Rain's Heart. She was a host there. Um, you'll get all the background information if you listen to the first part. Where can they listen to the first part, Donna? They can listen to the first part of this episode at a gem of a secret podcast.com. That's a gem of a secret podcast.com. You can also catch us on anywhere that you listen to podcasts at, pretty much, um, including Anchor, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, whatever you prefer. But yeah, check us out. I prefer YouTube. <laughs> You're, we're also on YouTube. We're also oh my on God, YouTube. wow. Hi, I'm Autumn. <laughs> <laughs> All so, right, so uh, I guess like the first question that I want to ask, we kind of got into it a little bit, just a tiny bit in the um, first part, but what was it like working with the owners of the uh, venue as well as, you know, other, enter- uh, other regular entertainment and also um, very importantly, the show director who was working closely with the Queens? So uh, with the owners, it wasn't a lot. They they more dealt with the bar, whereas Robert, the show director, uh, he dealt more with the show itself. Um, we would see Bob all the time. He would walk through. He was very proactive in the bar itself, whereas Steven was more of uh, what I observed as the money person. Well, let's he let dealt me ask more. a question about that, not meaning to interrupt here, but what what was his responsibilities as a show director. Like what, um, for our listeners who are not too drag savvy, what would a show director be in this capacity? So Robert Thomas would be there at, uh, so the show would start at 9.30. He would be there at nine. Music was due at nine. And he would be downstairs sitting at the table, ready with his uh, paper and pen. And you would give him, because even though it happened in 2016, you would break him your CD and you would tell him track and name. And so it would be uh, track 15, Bad Romance. And he would find your name on his paper and he would write it in. And it would be all that for all six numbers. And there would be mistakes. It would happen. And we would either do the number or yell at Robert from the back. So you would give this person, so this person had a collection. Well, actually, how many people performed in one night? Depends on the night. Uh, uh, Wednesday, Thursday would have the host maybe a co-host and three other people and then a guest so maybe six and so then six a... cds six oh CDs. oh many more oh wait yeah because you guys performed what did we say six numbers in a night yeah so he has would... six cds from one person could be up to that point so that means if you did it times five and everybody had like six that's like 30 cds yes yeah, so that's... if you had a cd booklet each one was numbered and so it would be uh hi it's autumn all right, well, your, your, first, your first number is in spot eight. And so you put your CD in eight and you tell them which number it was off that CD. That's and insane. So then, that kind and of makes so then sense. then if you like had multiple off that same CD, you'd be from CD eight, track, blah, name. God, so because like different. even I remember one time at a show I was asking about like flash drives and you're like, no one uses flash drives anymore. This is 2016 and they were using CDs. <laughs> I personally nowadays like to stay real vintage and turn my music in via mixtape. And, you know, sometimes it works out for me and sometimes it doesn't. I mean... Yeah, no, like, uh, and so that's how he would know if there were duplicate numbers, was if someone would say the same name. So if you didn't get there first, you're fine. You got to do somebody else's number, unless it's the host, in which case the host gets dips. Interesting. Oh, yeah. So, like, if you brought your CD and if somebody had your number, that that would suck. Yeah. Because you... It's a CD. <laughs> yeah, no, it happens. And sometimes the wrong CD plays, and sometimes the wrong number plays, and sometimes it doesn't play. And so if your number didn't play, 
you were off the Suicide CDs, which were either Madonna's classic hits or Cher's classic hits. And you were Suicide <laughs> CD? But I mean, oh like, gosh, but, but like staples, like they're staples of like- So you would get Material drag, Girl or you would culture. get Turn Back Time. Those are the yeah. two options. Okay, all right. Um, for mean, our listeners who are not too drag savvy, normally nowadays of drag show is the show producer will ask for the music to be emailed to them beforehand and they create the set list days before the show. So, Honeybee would actually, Honeybee was like a revolutionary numbers because you had to email her music and then she would put it on the CDs and she would give those CDs to Robert. Oh, oh okay. Gosh. So she would do all the organizing. I was a hot goddamn mess and my cast was illiterate. And so they would all just give me all of their numbers in advance. And then I would burn my CDs in the Ember's basement and then hope they worked. There oh, were a few oh. weeks they didn't. This is, I feel like I'm in the stone ages of drag. I just feel like I'm just serious. <laughs> oh, no, no. Insane. I've heard plenty of stories about how they would do, because uh, some of the older queens would call it a uh, CD blank, cut blank, because you'd have to do a cut for the records they would play back in their day. Oh. Wow. Whoa. They skipped tapes. It was records before that. I do and remember so it would be like It'd be like number six, cut four. I guess it's not like, it's not that archaic because I do remember turning in songs when I started doing shows via flash drive. I turned in songs via flash drives. I've done shows where I had to turn in songs via CDs. Okay. Um, and I burned a CD. I literally had to go to, because you can only get them at like Rite Aid nowadays. Yeah. To get a CD and then find a CD drive. And then I burned two songs onto the CD, wrote my name on it, Coco Jim Holiday, song one, song two and handed it to the person and just pray to the Lord Jesus that it didn't get scratched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's how it works. Whew. Huh. Okay, so I know we spent a lot of time there, but that was funny. Um, so let me ask, how, was the, how has the downtown scene changed since Ember's closed? It hasn't had a place for the court, really. Because the, the court used to have everything mm -hmm. at Ember's. Really? In the back room. Interesting. So you mean all those court meetings I've been to that are at Darcell's that used to be at Ember's? I don't know about that, but all of the the White Knight debutante pageant, which is now the Portland Knight, I think. I don't fucking know. Yes. Um, the uh, the Gay Oregon, Gay Portland, uh, every all of those three would happen at Ember's in the back bar. Okay, and just really quick along with this question, how long has it been since Ember's closed officially? Oh, yeah. Uh, it closed the week after Thanksgiving in 2017. Okay. That's honestly been, so actually this makes a little bit more sense then. It's been two be years. Because when you moved here, obviously in 2019, mm -hmm. um, it had only been roughly closed for like a year and a half. Yeah. And so that makes sense of why people were like, hey girl, blah, 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 Ember's, Ember's this. Yeah. And like, I just got here four minutes ago, but okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was still fairly fresh. So yeah, talk a little bit more about how it's changed though. Like, are do you feel like there is um, a place where you can see drag every night of the week here like you had at Embers? Or do you think there ever will be? So something that happened with the closing of Embers that I've noticed is the Embers queens were the Embers queens. If you go to like other cities, there's queens that perform at every bar. They do everything. Ember's Queens were Ember's Queens. They didn't perform anywhere else. Hmm. And so as soon as Ember's closed, that's when like my I myself, I branched out like crazy because I finally, because it was four nights of the week that I was doing Were it. you contracted to only work there? Was that why? Or was it just because you had like a loyalty to Ember's? Or, or an unspoken rule. Yeah. No, it just, Ember's girls didn't really get hired anywhere else unless huh. you were like a big thing. Well, and also, like, when, when you're working or supporting four nights a week, that really doesn't give you an opportunity to do that, though. To go. Yeah, I know. The first night that I did Stag Brunch back when it was Testify uh, with Alexis Campbell Star was the week after Ember's closed, and she was so gracious to give me a spot, and I'm still so thankful to her for all, that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you all had to kind of, like, branch out and kind of dig your roots in other venues after this close so then you can get known other places. Correct. Dang. That's crazy. And we're going to try to find uh, photos of a lot of the people we've mentioned in this two-part series to put them on our website. I probably won't find them all because I'll get too lazy. But um, yeah, I'll definitely try to see if I can find as many as I can um, like for their moments in time. 
Um, yeah. So, Coco, what's the next question that you would want to ask? So, um, I kind of want to know, um, what was it like when they closed and what happened to the community? How did people take it? Yeah, how do people take it? And then also kind of tell us a story about um, leading up to a closure. This is actually really important. So uh, me and Donna and Autumn all performed at uh, Henry's Tavern uh, for Flawless's show known as Legacy. And it's so interesting when a venue closes, what that does to the drag artists and how you hear about it and mm -hmm. what it means for your money and like what it means for your artistry or what you had planned. How many different people it affects. Um, yeah, like your husband who's the DJ making great money there every week. Anyway, um, <laughs> so um, I want to know, so on the Ember side, so how did you hear about it that they were closing? Um, what was like the last few shows or days like? Um, and then, uh, and then like, what did it feel like those first few weeks after it closed? Um, if you could go into that in detail. Um, so Thanksgiving is not normally a night that we would do like hella shows. We would bring whatever queens would do it and that would be that. But I think that time we decided that we just wouldn't have a show that night. Um, and that night, because Thursday was normally my night of the week, uh, I had someone else, I think, either covered or we just didn't have a show because I wasn't going to be there. Because uh, normally, like, Thanksgiving night, I drive to California just to, like, get away from everything while things aren't busy. Um, and so I drove all the way down to L.A. And Tuesday after, in 2017, I was on my way back. I think I was in the mountains uh, on the way back to Oregon. And uh, I got a call from Robert Thomas, the director, that said, hey, no, this was Monday, that said, hey, uh, we have a meeting tomorrow. No, this was Tuesday. This was Tuesday. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, be there. And I was like, okay. And so got back to Portland, uh, went to the meeting, and um, basically we were sitting in the back. We never had a meeting before. Uh, we're sitting in the back bar and we're told that uh, Stephen, one of the owners, had had a stroke on Thanksgiving and um, he had lived but was brain dead and didn't wow. have a living will. So no one could sign the checks or do anything. Wow. And so Thursday we were closing. Oh, er, yeah, no, so this was Tuesday, because Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, mm -hmm. Truly, like, terrible circumstance, too. So the bartenders laid off. Everyone was done. This 48-year-old bar was over. Um, we, we sat in a circle. It was whatever we can, make, we can make work for you, and that'll be your last paycheck. Wednesday, we'll have a show, and then Thursday will be the last show. And so since I was the Wednesday night host, um, also everyone's things that were in the basement needed to be gone within two days yeah that would make sense yeah um so uh the wonderful and beautiful kimberly michelle westwood made posters for uh the last two shows or at least mine i don't know i think she did it for the last one we're not sure um and so there were two more shows i hosted the wednesday show with uh carly as my co-host and then uh, Crystal and Onyx. Onyx was the host. Crystal was the co-host for that, I do believe, for the Friday show. Friday, what the fuck? Uh, Friday, uh, the Thursday show. That's the one. At that point, we had to get all of our shit out and then also do a show. Yeah. I'm sure it was um, emotional. Yeah. And so the last show that I hosted there... Uh, on that Wednesday, it was busier than it like it had ever been. Mm. Really, on a weekday besides Saturday, and it was packed and it was like insane. My parents were there for the entire show that I hosted Thursday. Um, the bar had a line around the block for the first time in like ten years, mm. and you couldn't walk through it. It was literally packed, like sardines. And uh, people that hadn't performed there in years and years, had, uh, like hosts, people that had performed there 
back in the 80s. They all came back. They all did numbers. And it was the most amazing send-off it could have had. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really sad. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really sad set of circumstances that led to the closure of, you know, an establishment that had been around so long. And then, yeah, no, like, Friday it was closed. And after that, they started a sale to sell off everything that the bar had hmm. like i bought a patron machine <laughs> like that's how much they were selling yeah that wow and then wow that's that's honestly really sad yeah it's heartbreaking and it it makes sense why to me now why there were so many people that were affected by it and really loved the place. Well, I think it's because they didn't get the long goodbye. There's some, no. there's a mourning period that does happen when venues close. It sometimes, also, sometimes, sometimes. It also was just sad that it was such a dive bar before the last two days of it closing, and then once it closed, it turned into the most popular place in town. Yeah. Yeah, that's always really hard. I think one thing, too, to say to our listeners, though, is that you said that usually there's a mourning period. That hasn't been the case for us every single time that we've worked at a venue. Because remember, like, the news about um, one of the bars that we worked at in our home city, we we saw the notice on the door that they were closed all of a sudden. Yes. And and that was that was our, our big notice that it was closed, and we all of a sudden didn't have a place to do shows anymore. So it can happen like that. It can happen really fast to where you have a little bit of a mourning period to understand what's happening and to try and recollect and all of that. And, you know, not only do do, did you guys have a mourning period for um, for the fact that your establishment was closing, but the fact that, you know, the owner was going through such a, you know, had had such a terrible thing happen to them because of their health you know like that's that's hard to deal with um, well it wasn't it wasn't horribly long after that the other owner that didn't go through that had passed away mm. oh geez wow wow that's really sad yeah that's i mean and it's sad to see you know like these these new queens and these newcomers that are in town like we see just this building that was there and we don't really understand the history of it so i think it's important for people to tell the story of of this place because it does have such a rich history. And um, like you said in the first part of the episode, it will never be recreated here, but um, it definitely um, is a spirit that we can try to keep around to keep drag alive in the city by um, supporting the shows that we have that are here and the venues that are still around in Portland and the new ones that will pop up, so. Well, and, and actually thinking about to make it more current, Remember, we're in quarantine right now. Yeah. Um, I've gotten word that the bar that we used to host our Starlets and Harlots show at, which we've talked about on an earlier podcast, and Autumn is on cast for that show. Um, we heard that that venue is closing. Yeah. Um, because of quarantine. Uh, they hadn't been open for very long. Um, yeah. And so trying to weather a storm like this is really challenging, um, especially because that's a large venue. So I'm assuming the overhead was just astronomical. So I... I heard that, that that was closing. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about in this series is I want to also just like, remember the seasons change and things will happen and you can't really plan for them. But you have to remember that like perseverance is really important. Just because your venue closed doesn't mean that some of these people gave up on drag. Most of them found homes in other venues. Um, to be able to like live and recreate their art, yeah, um, which is really great and really fantastic. Um, and the thing is, with a venue that you are so embedded in, things probably will never be the same as that venue that you were at. You know, you you may never have the same setup or the same culture of the of uh, the venue that you were once at. But it's it's your responsibility and your job to keep the great things that you loved about that previous venue at these newer venues. So you know, just what I think is sad myself especially with this venue is like the history yeah because i myself learned a lot of gay history in the basement just listening to robert thomas the show director talk yeah and talk about especially the people in this community and the people that had perished before from you know like the aids crisis and everything yeah. and just how things were back in the past like it still hits me to this day and there's new uh, entertainers now that won't get that 
it's just really important and it's something that I'm really sad that we aren't able to have because I myself learned a lot and really cherish those moments where I would be able to learn something especially from like someone that had been there for a while yeah yeah Yeah. for sure um so uh moving on to our last question do you have anything that you want to plug or do you know of anything happening with the embers cast well i know that the embers building was bought by badlands which is uh not like the san francisco one but like the the sacramento one and have they done work who knows maybe it'll open they said two years ago they would open by summer it hasn't Mm. but there might be something coming from uh, the old host from the Embers Avenue coming to a live Facebook near you. We'll see. Cool, cool. Yeah, so stay tuned for that, um, for, for the show that they're going to bring back from the old host. What were the old hosts called exactly? It was, so they're like the Hall of Famers? So anyone that hosted a show was part of the Embers Hall of Fame. Okay. And anyone that hosted a Saturday was a first lady. And there's a very select few of those and a very smaller select few that are still with us. And um, it, it like, being part of it was an honor, but, like, mm-hmm. being a first lady was, like, a huge honor. Especially, like, Onyx and Valentine, who is, like, the last one and who is the youngest one. She... Interesting question. Was there an actual Hall of Fame in Embers? Yes, there's a list. Cool. In the back room, not like the front, but like in the back room, just so everyone could see who the hosts were. You hmm. mentioned to me off um, off the podcast that there's a, a Facebook page. Yeah, no. So the Facebook page, uh, if if you like want to scroll far enough, it's not that far down, but uh, it is the Embers Avenue Memorial. It has a list of everyone that had hosted there and just like a final few memories. Um, yeah, no, it was a really big place in the community and it's really sad to see it gone still yeah yeah well um we want to thank you for um educating us about the history of embers and what it was like before we were here um and uh thanks for coming on to be a part of our podcast in both of these parts um it was a really cool history rich episode that we had so we hope our listeners really enjoyed this and um can get a good understanding of what drag was like when Embers was around. All right, everybody, that concludes this episode of A Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. My name is Coco Gem Holiday. And I am Autumn Rain's Heart. We will see you every Thursday when we record a new episode. Bye. Bye.